you know what? Let's do something a little different this morning. Just go ahead and uh, find a few people around you and gather up and just pray a real quick prayer of encouragement over one another. Um, so go ahead and just circle up in a few few people. Come on, New Life, let's not leave anybody out. You know, if you see somebody by themselves, go ahead and let's come on, let's be a family. We're not a bunch of individuals this morning. Let's encourage each other. Let's be a body. Come on. Get out of your bubble. There's a light burns in the darkness There is a hope that washes the fear away There is a peace that settles around us It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze light shines in the darkness there is a hope that washes the fear away there is a peace that settles around us yeah it is your love that sets our hearts ablaze Father, we're on our knees with every heartbeat. We bring you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Come on, lift your voice. We need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. There is a king that reigns in victory There is a mercy strong enough to save We 
feel her rising up from the ashes Here's love, it overcame the grave
Some darkness in your life. There's no question in your mind, God Almighty. God of mercy. There's no hiding from your No striving in your grace, God of mercy, in God all my peace. Let there be light, open the eyes of the No borders in your love, no division in your heart, God of heaven, God of freedom, there's no taking back the cross.
are.
heart and flesh cry out for you the living god your spirit's water to my soul because i've tasted and i've seen come once again to me i will draw near to you i will draw near to you fellowship, that we can have friendship, that we can have faith, Lord God, that you are here with us, Lord God, and we're not surprised by that, that your presence should be naturally within your people. So, Father, as we take this offering, Lord God, we do so because we trust you and we love you and we want others to know that love as well. Help us, Lord God, as we take this offering to honor you. In Jesus, we pray and all God's people said, if you have an offering, please bring it ahead. flesh cry out for you the living God your spirit's water to my soul let's sing that again my heart my heart and flesh cry out for you the living God your spirit's water to my soul cause I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Cause better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Oh, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Than thousands elsewhere, or oh, thousands elsewhere. Jesus, good? All the time? We'll find out by the time we're done today, amen. Let's, let's have a seat, please. Glad that you're with us this morning. A couple of announcements to make, real quick. Next Sunday is our membership class, so if you want to be a part of what we're doing, go to New Life, uh, New 490.info, and sign up for that. Uh, also, to those of you that attend Tongue Point, um, in two weeks, it's the March 4th. Uh, we're gonna have you guys stay after church, and we're gonna take you out for pizza, and then we're gonna come back here, and we're gonna share. I'm gonna have the le ministry leaders. I want you to meet them, and I want them to share their story, and you're gonna we're gonna ask you to share your story if you so would be comfortable doing that uh, because we want you to know that we we don't just appreciate your attendance we want to know you and so uh, March 4th for you those of you that are in Tongue Point always makes me nervous when someone's behind me 
And don't tell me what I did. I don't want to know. <laughs> Let's, can we stand for just a moment and pray? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do me a favor and pray for me. I'm really struggling today with letting go of, of the things. And, and I think we are too, because I kind of sense that. I just felt that in the 9 o'clock, and I kind of feel it today, that we're kind of holding on to the earth a little bit today. Um, so let's, uh, let's just spend a few moments in prayer. Pray for me, please, uh, that I would release the things of earth, that I can be connected to the things of God, and that you would be in the same boat. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father, we need you today. We need to hear from you today. We need to leave this place with confidence. We need to leave this place in comfort. And we can't find those things on the earth like we can find them in Christ. So open our hearts today that we may honor you and you may bless us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we're in a series on discipleship, <clears throat> I don't want to go into too much detail on that. I'm actually cutting out the first page of what I was going to talk to you about. <laughs> because part of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, living in connection with the Spirit of God, and yet still connected to this body, this flesh, this earth. There's a, a battle that goes on every day in all of our lives. It will happen every day until you die. And then if you die and Jesus is your Savior, you'll be in heaven. And this flesh will not be there. We'll leave it here. And you can use my body parts for extra whatever you want because I don't care. Because I'll be there, and I'll have new hair. <laughs> yeah, those of you bald guys are like, I'll have hair in heaven. Yeah, that's going to be great. Or maybe we won't have hair in heaven. Maybe heavenly really is bald. <laughs> but there's a wrestling, there's a... a a battle, and, and the, the word that we're going to look at today is temptation. And, and I want you to realize that I'm not going to bring temptation across as like, like the issue that I had this week with the temptation to eat a cheeseburger, and I know I shouldn't have eaten it. That, that, really, that was more an issue of was the burger healthy for me or not. And, and it was actually just making the right decision, and I made the wrong one. It was really good. <laughs> I'm going to die a very happy man. But I think temptation, I think Satan, what he's trying to do with us every day is bigger than that. As we look at the story of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus, it's easy to just automatically say that it's about Satan putting a cheeseburger in front of us. And we know we shouldn't eat the cheeseburger, but we eat the cheeseburger anyway. So we failed in temptation. I think it's bigger than that. I think it's bigger than buying your wife a birthday cake for her birthday. And knowing she can't eat that birthday cake because of allergies and you eat the whole thing. I think it's more than that. <laughs> it was really good. That's why when you buy someone a birthday cake, buy the one you want. <laughs> oh, my granddaughter loved it. It had this thick of frosting. It was awesome. All right, all right, all right, stop. <laughs> Temptation is really, what I'm going to bring out today, 
it, it's really about communication. Temptation is really about, am I listening to the Spirit of God? Or am I listening to this body? And is my soul struggling with what is true? Is what the body telling me is true, like I'm hungry and I'm going to die? Have, has, has your body ever done that? You get hungry and I'm going to die. You're not going to die. <laughs> right? You got enough fat on you to last you a long time. <laughs> no, yeah. Welcome to new life. I just called everyone fat. And, and those of you that are really skinny are like, did he call me fat? Am I really fat? <laughs> and us fat ones are like, yes. <laughs> we are one. <laughs> Would you stop? I'll never get anywhere today. And I'm going to have to cut out three pages. But we face a temptation every day. Satan wants us to hold on to the things of earth. He wants us to focus on the things of earth. He does not want us to connect with God. He does not want our spirits to be communicating with our souls to tell us that we can trust him. And so this battle goes on within us every day with what is true. And so to, to, to explain that a little, let me, let's just start and we'll kind of get there. Right? Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, we find the story of Jesus being tempted. And the scripture says this. Did I say, yeah, 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness... For 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Makes sense to me. And there's a couple of words I want you to notice. So first, I want you to notice the word full or fullness. And it, it, the picture of Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit, meaning that his soul was fully immersed by God. He had let go of everything on the earth and was wholly focused on the Spirit's leading. Now, we know that because he was obedient to the leading of God. And so let me just help you with this. Fullness of the Spirit always leads to following God fully. I can tell you're excited about that. That was great. Fullness of the Spirit literally means that I will be obedient to God in every aspect of my life. I'm going to hear what God says. I'm going to do what God says because I'm full of Him. The second word I want you to look at is, it's actually, it's, it's the idea of Him fasting for 40 days and it's weakness. Now Jesus was fasting and the purpose for fasting was to seek to clarify the connection between the Spirit and um, and the flesh and the soul. And so when you fast, what you're saying, you're telling your body you don't need food. And your body's telling you, yes, I do. Try fasting. I, I tell you what, don't eat lunch. And by 2 o'clock, your stomach will be telling you, feed me. By 5 o'clock, you're going to be thinking, I'm going to die. By 6 o'clock, you'll be in your wife's cake. No matter how much frosting, you'll get a sugar high, then you'll fall asleep. It'll be a great night. See, what Jesus was doing was he was trying to connect, he was trying to, to, to decide or decipher whose voice he was going to listen to. And so if you deny the flesh, if you tell the flesh, I'm not listening to you, it, it lets you really find it, kind of decipher whose voice you're listening to, whether it's really of God or it's of the flesh. Because sometimes our flesh actually sounds like God to our souls. It sounds very similar. Now remember as I said last week that Satan works in the soul. He tries to get us to stay connected to the things of earth, to separate, to separate us from the things of God. And he works within the soul to try to do that. But remember, this passage isn't about his temptation in there, but the communication that goes on with our soul that comes from him. It's about that struggle we have to understand 
So just so you know, when Satan says something like that, he already knows the answer to it. If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, he also knew as the Son of God that Jesus would not have any problem uh, making a, a rock into, into a loaf of bread. He, he knew that was so. So we got to think about what's he saying to him. And Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. So we got to decipher, what is he really saying to Jesus? What is he really trying to communicate to Jesus' soul? And if you were to take this interaction on face value, you would say that seek, he was seeking Jesus to prove his sonship, meaning that he would have to make stones bread to ease his hunger. But the reality is, the truth is, Satan's voice wasn't challenging Jesus' ability to turn a rock into bread, but challenging his father's provision. Or his father's love. Because if people love us, they provide for us, don't they? As a dad, if you love your kids, you provide for them. You go to work and you work hard so you can provide food for your family. And of course yourself, a little cake for birthday. <laughs> See, what Satan was doing, and I think what he does with us, is he's trying to get Jesus to take care of himself because God wasn't. The temptation wasn't that he was hungry for bread. The temptation was, if God loved me, he'd never leave me hungry. If God really loved me, he'd never let me live in lack or with less. Because if your father loved you, he'd never make you go hungry, would he? Have you ever been tempted to doubt God's love in the desert of emptiness? Where you just didn't have something, and you're like, God, if you love me, why wouldn't you give me this? God, if you really love me, why wouldn't you provide for me? If, come on, you love me. You're, you're my God. You're supposed to provide all my need. But at times we're tempted to say to God when he doesn't provide our need, I got this, I'll take care of it myself. And we decide to make our own bread. Go our own way, handle things in our own power. Because the reality is, for the most part, we can handle most of our lives on our own, in our own power. We, we're fully capable of taking care of ourselves until we die. But we do it without God. See, Satan simply insinuated that God didn't care or was disinterested in his problem, and if he really loved him, he would provide for him. I mean, if God loved you, why would he make you go hungry? Have you not ever had that battle that goes on that says, if God won't take care of me, I'm going to have to take care of myself. I'm going to have to fix this. I'm going to have to straighten it out. I'm going to have to provide for my family. I'm going to have to provide for myself. The second thing I want you to see or hear is the voice that I think speaks to us really loudly, and it says, I want easy. The first voice that says, I got this. If you're not going to take care of me, then, then I'll take care of myself. I'll turn my own stones into bread. I'll do it in my own power. I'll handle life on my own. But the second one says, I want easy. Let me give you the picture. Luke chapter 4 and verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So that was, there's some spiritual ability that Satan has to be able to do that. And Satan said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I'll give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Which is a classic story of selling your soul to the devil to get ahead. And this speaks loudly to your soul, because it, remember I talked about the soul last week, doing what's best for itself. The soul always is going to seek the best thing for itself. And it's the one that says, if it's what's best for you is to never experience anything difficult. Is that not true? How many of our souls actually want to go through something harsh or hard or difficult? We want everything to be easy, don't we? The devil takes Jesus up and he shows him the earth and he says, I'll give you power, popularity, and pleasure if you just worship me. If you live your life for me, if you give your life to me, I'll give you all these things. They'll belong to you. Do you know what Satan's plan for Jesus was to bypass the plan of God? You know what the plan of God included for Jesus? Rejection. How many of you have been rejected by your parents and you've 
you've really struggled with that. And the idea is, you say, I wish that I had parents like somebody else because that would have been the better plan for me. Or you've, you, 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 you've struggled with the rejection of friends. Why don't I have more friends? I, I think God should, if God really loved me, he'd give me better friends. Satan's plan for Jesus was no rejection, was no betrayal of friends and family. No crucifixion. Jesus wouldn't have ever had to experience the crucifixion. He never would have been beaten and bruised falsely. He would have never have been falsely accused. He would never have been nailed to a cross. And he would never have bled. He never would have suffered. There would have been no pain in Jesus' life. If he just would have gone with Satan's plan, then there would have been no pain for Jesus. There would have been no death. How many of us get upset at God because somebody dies in our family? We want it easy. We want our, our family members to live forever. We want everyone around us to live forever. We can't let them die. We can't do that. God, if you really loved me, everyone would stay alive. He was trying to get Jesus to take the easiest route to life. The route that was best for Jesus. But if Jesus would have taken the easiest route for life, how would have that affected you? And me? See, Satan says if God really loved you, he'd never allow pain to be in part of your life. If God really loved you, you'd never experience sadness and hurt and suffering. You know what's interesting about this whole story? It's a lie that Satan spun to believe that, that the easy way is the better way. Do you know, he says, uh, I'll give you this. This was, what did he say? Let me read it. Uh, For it's been delivered to me, and I'll give it to whom I will. The earth wasn't delivered to him. He was cast out of heaven, and there was one place to go, here. It didn't belong to him. He doesn't have the ability to make your life easier. Following him, worshiping him, doing worldly things, being connected to the earth will not guarantee an easy life. You can live this life without Jesus and still go through the exact same pain and struggles that you're going to go through with Jesus. They're not different. You get cancer with Jesus, you get cancer without Jesus. You still get cancer. People die because people die. That's what happens. Death happens whether or not you're saved or lost. People have bad marriages in Christ and bad marriages out of Christ. People are lonely and sad and broken. They're addicted. It doesn't matter whether you're in or out. What I'm saying is from a standpoint of if life's going to be easy. I don't know about you, but I've never met anyone that actually had an easy life. Well, people with money have an easy life. No, they don't. They commit suicide all the time because they don't know what to do with their lives. Have you ever heard that voice in your head that says, I just want it easy. I just want it easy. I don't want it to be so hard. Why does it have to be so hard, God? I'm going to give you the third voice, and this is the one that bothers me the most from a Christian standpoint. It's the voice that speaks to us and says, prove it. Prove it. Now, it's the voice that our soul speaks to God. Luke chapter 4 and verse 9 says, And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands will they bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, You should not put the Lord to the test. And we'll talk about that in a minute. What he was trying to get Jesus to do was to prove that God was who God said he was. Now, this is kind of funny, speaking from the Son of God, that you would prove that your father is actually who your father says he is. Right? Is that silly? To, 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 okay, prove to me that uh, I should have brought a picture of my dad and should have put it on the wall. Because if you saw a picture of my dad, you would know he's my dad. <laughs> now, that's all the evidence is in the face and the belly but that's, and, and the ear hair. But that's a whole... That's, can't help you with that. 
Satan says to Jesus' soul, if God is who he says he is and you believe it, make him prove it. Show me a sign. And how many of you have said to God throughout time, show me a sign? If you are who you really say you are, then you prove it to me. Now think about that statement for a minute. You're telling your father to prove himself that he's your father. I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. I mean, that's... <laughs> See, if God is, who are we to expect him to prove himself to us? If God is. You know that God doesn't have to prove himself to us? He's God. When he first introduced himself to Israel, he said, I am. That's, who are you? Just tell him I am. Well, who is I am? I've always been. I always are. Always will be. I don't know. Pick any name you want, but I'm God, and I don't have to prove myself to you. Now, he chooses to reveal himself to us, but he doesn't have to. See, I think we do this when God doesn't provide for us the way that we think he should. And we say, God, prove yourself to me. I think we do this when his plan isn't best for us. God, you need to prove yourself to me. I think we do this when his proof isn't enough for us to just obey. I'm, I'm amazed at the number of believers, believers, disciples, who run around saying, I'll obey God when he proves it to me first. Instead of just obeying his word and obeying what he says, we've got to say, he needs to prove it to me. So, so, and, and by the way, the reason you run around studying something you don't want to obey is because you don't want to obey it. It's not because you want to really know the truth. It's because you know the truth and you don't want to submit to the truth. Yeehaw. Okay. <laughs> See, the first voice tempts us to live our lives in our own provision. The first voice, Satan's trying to get us to take care of things ourselves because God, if he really loved us, he would provide for us, wouldn't he? The second voice that tempts us to live our lives in our own plan. That God's plan sucks, that it includes pain and suffering and sadness. And I don't want to live in that life, and so I'm going to show God I'm going to do it on my own. Like your life is going to be any different on your own than it is with God, but that's the different, you know, whatever you want to say. The reality is the plan is the plan. And the third voice tempts us to seek evidence through experience, which is not faith. Because faith is the substance of things Hope for the evidence of things. Show me a sign. No, no, no. Faith is the evidence of not seeing. That God is. That God is everything he says he is. And if God is who he says he is, who are we to tell him, prove yourself to me? See, remember, we're talking about a voice that's communicating to our soul that's trying to decide what is true. And the question is, do, does that voice move us to say to God, I've got to get back here, say to God, I got this. You're not taking care of me. I'll take care of myself. I don't trust your word. I don't trust your provision. I'll have to take care of myself. Does that voice move you to say, I want easy. I don't like the plan you have for my life. Your plan sucks. My plan's easy. Or is it the voice that constantly says to God, prove it. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. And Jesus answered rightly on all three of these. And here's what he said. He said, it's not the provision of the earth, but the promise of God that shows love. What? It's not the provision of earth, but the promise of God that shows that he loves. Luke 4, 4, Jesus said, it's written that man shall not live by bread alone, not earthly provision but by every word of God. Which is a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's why I read it in the King James. So those of you would have the direct quote in there, but if, it's, if your Bible doesn't say that, go to Deuteronomy 8 and it will tell you the rest of it. See, if God's promised to love, then provision isn't love, promise is. And this is difficult for us to wrap our minds around because we, want to, we believe that pro, uh, love is provision, not promise. We, that is a cute baby. We, we want to believe that if God really loves that he'd provide. But you know what God's done is he's already promised us provision. It just might not be on the earth. You know, if you read your Bible, you'll find several stories of people who experienced God's provision on earth miraculously. But you'll also experience several people who never got to experience uh, uh, the, the promises. And, and I'll, I'll give you some illustrations. Uh, every prophet who ever preached that there was a Savior coming who didn't get to meet the Savior... 
died without ever meeting the Savior that they preached about. Not one of them received the promises. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about all these people who received these promises from God on earth. Promises from God, promises from God. And then there's a group that he says, yeah, and these guys, they didn't receive the promises. They were destitute and poor and broken. And they were naked and in peril and in problems and life sucked. But that's also the group that in heaven have been promised a special place. But see, we're so focused on the on the on the um, provision that we're not realizing what he's providing for us up there is way better than anything we could receive down here. If God's promise to love, then provision isn't love. Promise is. It's not the pain of the earth, but the plan of God that's love. Luke chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said, Get behind me, Satan, for it's, a, it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, if I truly worship or value God above everything, that includes the plan for my life, right? If I truly believe he is more important than me, if I truly believe that God is more valuable than, to me, than me, then his plan for my life is more important than my plan for my life, Correct? That means he can choose, if I'm a servant of him, then he can choose to do whatever he wants to with my life. If it's better for the kingdom, if it's better for God, then he has every right to take me and use my life any way he chooses, right? If he is truly God, if we worship him, if we surrendered our lives to him, then whatever God takes with our life and does with it is up to him, right? And out of love, he takes your life, no matter how hard and difficult it is, and says, I'm going to make something beautiful out of it. We talked about beauty for ashes. That's what he does. He takes us as the ashes of our ruined life and takes something, makes something beautiful out of it. All those, listen, I think of all those people uh, I'll, I'll pull back. We, we talk about a verse in Jeremiah that says that God has promised plans for good and for hope for us, that God's plans all have. But if you read the passage right above that, it says that's after 70 years of bondage. I've got some good plans for you, but for 70 years, it's going to suck. Right? For 70 years, this is going to be hard. For 70 years, you're going to be in bondage to, to somebody who's not going to care about you. You're going to be in a distant land. You're not going to live in your own home. You're not going to be comfortable. But after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back to that place. And then we're going to start to restore the, the, the people of Israel. And I've got a promise that I've got a, a better life for you. Now, here's the interesting thing. After that 70 years, God brought the children of Israel back into the promised land. And it was another 400 years before Jesus showed up. So for 400 years, they didn't even hear from God. But that doesn't mean that his promise for a better life wasn't true. The question is, are you listening to the voice that says, I want it easy or I surrender all? If God is who God says he is, then do we surrender our plans to his, no matter how difficult they are? Let me give you the third part. See, it's not proof on the earth that God is but faith that's the evidence of God's love. Jesus answered and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If he is actually my Lord and he is my God, then I'm just going to trust that he is and that he does, and he doesn't have to show himself to me. He still is and does. See, God is without evidence. Satan says God has to prove himself. God says I don't have to. You ever been in one of those arguments, you know? Do to, do not, do to, do not, do to, do not, do to, do not. You ever have one of those with God? Prove yourself. No. Prove yourself. No. Prove yourself. I, it's like God's up there in heaven going, who are you to tell me to prove myself to you? I'm God. Again, God chooses to reveal himself, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to show up the way you want him to. He doesn't have to provide the way you think he should. He doesn't have to make your plan easier if you think that's best. But Satan keeps wanting to tell you, 
I got this, because God doesn't. I want it easy, because God's not making it easy. And prove it. If you're really God, you need to show yourself to us. And we wrestle with that. Come on, are, are, have you not wrestled with that? Have you not had that wrestling in your soul? If God loved me, why? Why won't he provide? If God loved me, why? Why is there so much pain? If God loved me, why won't he just show himself to me? Because he's already, already promised. A plan of proof. He's already promised a plan of proof. See, when we listen to the voice of the Spirit of God and not the voice of the earth, we know that we can trust in the promises. We know that even if God hasn't provided, He will, and it might not be on this earth. It might be in heaven that I have to wait to get my mansion with my Harley. And you Honda riders should be very excited about that. It might be, it just might be that you're going to get to heaven one day and you're going to look back on your pain-filled life and realize, look at what God did through that because you lived by faith, not by fear. You didn't live rejecting the plan. You, you embraced the plan, or the pain. You embraced the plan and you took it on and said, I'm going to do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and than what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing. And wouldn't it be cool to get up to heaven and point to him and say, I always knew you were. I always knew you were. God is. And if he is in me, I trust in his provision, honor him in pain, and believe without proof to you. comes to the plan what's true is this pain for his glory are these problems for him will they honor him if I live live them out going through these things instead of holding on to them and fighting God's plan all the time what is true is God real to you does he have to prove himself to you or is God God then if he is God, then why do you keep listening to Satan? Why do you stay connected to this earth and think that this is the best life possible when we already know eternity is the best life we will ever live because I won't have to live in this body that struggles with cake and fat. I won't have to deal with those voices inside my soul, doubting and discouraging and depressing thoughts and feelings and emotions. I don't have to be questioning whether God loves me because if I'm focused on the eternal, if I'm full of the Spirit, I know that I am loved and cared for and I can be comforted in that. A few years ago, you've heard this story several times, but I'm going to keep going back to it because it was actually a, probably one of the most pivotal moments in my life I wrestled with these voices and some of you got to witness the crazy <laughs> and I remember Jesus was full of the spirit and still tempted so be careful but the reality is is I was wrestling with the voices I looked at what God was providing for me and I thought God what is, what is wrong with you do you not love me I, I don't like what you're providing I why won't you give me 
fill in the blank. Every day it was something new. Why don't you give me better friends? Why don't you give me a better church? <laughs> At least I say it out loud. You say it behind my back. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Why won't you give me a better home? Why don't you give me a better life? Why don't you give me... Whatever it was, it was always seeking provision and not looking at the promises. I was looking at what I was receiving here on earth and it was causing me discouragement and doubt and depression. And I remember saying to God, I don't like this plan. This is not the plan. My plan was this. Grow up, get a job, get a wife, work my job, have some kids, grow them up, kick them out, <laughs> make them have grandbabies, Amen. retire, and be happy the whole way. My plan did not include a child with, with, with a liver, needing a liver transplant at eight months old. That was not part of my plan. I was a good person. I worked hard. I probably wasn't as good in high school as I was, I, I became. But I didn't, that was not part of my plan. To live in fear of the loss of my daughter for month after month after month. And even, she's 28 years old. Maybe she's older than that. I don't know how old she is. <laughs> However old she is, I still worry about how long she's going to to live because I have to live with a child who's got a special need like that. And I, um, it's like, that's not my plan, God. I look at people who are unsaved, who have kids that are healthy. Why don't I get those kids? <laughs> Nothing against my own. <laughs> Come on, haven't you thought that? My plan did not include going into ministry. My plan included retiring from the paper mill with eight weeks of vacation and ride my Harley and work four days and get four days off. We got to work that out in the ministry, guys. We got to really work on a four days on, four days off thing. It wasn't, wasn't my plan. It wasn't my plan to transition a church. It wasn't my plan to have people hate it wasn't my plan to lose friends. It wasn't my plan to lose family members. It wasn't my plan for my dad to die on me when I was 35. It wasn't my plan for my mom to die on me when I was 32 after she was, after she was eating, um, what are those, sweet potatoes with, um, oh, yeah, I can't eat them now. I killed my mom. And uh, it was actually high diabetes, but that's not the point. I didn't plan on that. I planned on my parents living forever because that's what's supposed to happen, Right? I didn't plan all this stuff. I didn't, I didn't plan to go through depression so many times. I didn't plan to struggle physically. I didn't plan to not be the pastor that I had hoped that I would be. I didn't plan on all this stuff. And I said to God, I don't like your plan. Your plan sucks. And every day, I'm telling you, ask Deborah. Every day I would come home and say, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to do this anymore. Have you ever said that in your soul? I just don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like where I am. I don't like what I feel. I don't like what I'm experiencing. I don't want to do this anymore. And I said to God, you're going to have to prove yourself. By the way, don't pray over here. There's a burn spot. That's where God was. I think he was going to... <laughs> I'm over here praying, God... God, if, you're, if you are who you say you are, then you need to A, B, and C. <laughs> when some of your names came up. No. <laughs> if, you, if you're God, you need to blah, 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 whatever it was. I can't remember what I was saying. But haven't you ever done that? God, you're going to have to prove yourself to me. Because I don't know if I want to keep going on as a believer. If, if you're not going to reveal yourself, if you're not going to make this plan better, if you're not going to provide better, if you're not going to do those things, then I'm just going to get myself a job, and I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to say I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to go to church, because then and that would be too much. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I just want to be religious, because religious people have it easy. When I went to college, when I, I had never experienced this before. I went to college with a Catholic, and it was, it was amazing. He would party all week and then go to church on Sunday, get rid of it, and start all over again. It was awesome. No guilt, no shame. No, it's like, 
How does that work? I wanted to build my own confession. I did. I just wanted, that, that's kind of cool. Get some beads. I don't know what that's all about. I just think, man, those guys, those guys got it so much easier than me. Be one of those religions where if you don't do certain things, you die. God just kills you. I mean, so you don't have a choice. Come on, haven't you ever done that? Said, God, you got to prove yourself to me. But he's God. He doesn't have to do anything. And he's still God. And I remember a guy came back. And I was still crazy. You, you people are crazy for having me. I wasn't ready, but I, God was just... Satan was still working. I was still trying to figure the voices out in my head. I was still trying to, to understand what God was doing. And, and it was about August of that year. And I just, in prayer, I just had this clarity. I had to make a decision whether God was real, whether I was going to stick with a plan, and whether I was going to be satisfied with his provision. And it was a moment that seemed really kind of silly, but it was all of a sudden a moment that I just said no. God is real, God is good, and God is love. And at that moment, I surrendered my life to him again. And I told those voices to shut up. Because that voice that says, I got it, really, I didn't want to have it. I was tired of doing it on my own. And that voice that said to me, I want it easy. I didn't really want it easy. I just wanted to understand. And that voice that said, God, I knew God was God. Come on, man. Remember what I said last week, how when God created us, he breathed life into us, and there's a, a little piece of him in each and every one of us. And I, so I knew, I knew, I knew he was God. But I had to decide whose voice to listen to. I had to decide what's true. So what's true when you don't have provision? Does God still love you? Enough to sacrifice his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. And through that salvation, give you the opportunity to one day leave this stinking planet that has people in it that actually kill children. It makes no sense to me. Why would we want to stay here? I want to go there where everything is love. How do I know that? Because God is love and he shines his light on everything, so everything's love. Haven't you struggled with, with the plan? Maybe you're struggling right now. Maybe it's like this, I don't like, I don't like this. But does that mean that's not the best thing for God? Does that mean it's not the best thing for him? Have you ever thought that maybe your sad life, the sucky parts of it, are actually the best thing for him? That sometimes the pain that you're going through, because you're, you're living it th through it by faith, it might just be actually a thing that brings people to Christ because they see your testimony of love. They see your testimony of life. And they believe in what you're believing in because there's something strange to them. Haven't you ever just wanted God to say, this clearly show, not say, but clearly show that he is there? And I thought about that. Every day the sun comes up, the Bible says, we're starting over again. It's like God says, I'm here. Let's do it again. And at the end of the day, I might be in tears. Or I might be saying, I, I don't like this. I don't know what voice. But I know this in the morning, the sun's going to come up. Because my God will bring it up. See, I know that some of you wonder if God loves you because you're empty and you're hungry. Can I just say this? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says all these things shall be added unto you. Seek him. Trust him. Trust his promises. Trust what he says. He will take care of you. It might not be the way you want. It might not be what you think you need. But I promise you, it will be provision. 
Think about this. When God fed the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness, he fed them with manna from heaven. You know what that's called? Angel's food. Angel food cake. <laughs> Come on. Manna from heaven. Mix that with a cheeseburger. You got a meal the last year. A meal to bring on a heart attack. If you just seek him, he'll take care of you. But you've got to seek him, not his provision. And I know some of you are worn out by the plan of God. I know you're hurting, and I know you hate it. But I know you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. You've got to let God do his work. And I know some of you are wondering if God can be trusted and you doubt him. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, just acknowledge him. And he'll guide you. He'll direct your path. See, I also know that the Spirit of God is trying to speak to you today. He's trying to get you to let go of the flesh and trust by faith. And he wants you to choose this morning to live believing but evidence through obedience. But you've got to choose who you're going to listen to. You've got to choose who you're going to listen to. Because if you're listening to God, it's always going to come from a heart of faith and love. And he's going to expect obedience. Because if what he says to you is true, it's worthy of obedience too. Right? Right? Trust me, I have not arrived at this. I have not found a magical formula for spiritual living. If I did, I would sell it on eBay. <laughs> or what, what's that other show that's on TV that you buy things from? QVC. I just wanted to know who the sinners were in the building. See, I choose to be seeking to connect with the Spirit every day. See, the idea of being full of the Spirit is not a, a one-time act that just happens and I'm like always topped off because the Satan is constantly trying to drain me of God. And so every day I've got to constantly seek, God, what do you want? God, what are you doing? God, where do you want me? I want to hear your voice. I want to trust what you say. Every day my flesh keeps trying to connect to its surroundings and it keeps trying to connect to the things of the earth to drain me of God. And I got to constantly say, no, no, I'm not going to listen to what you say no matter what my provision is, no matter what my pain is, no matter what my proof needs to be. I'm going to trust in God. Who are you listening to? As the worship team comes up, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? If you're listening to Jesus, if you're listening to the Spirit of God, if you're listening to God, it'll be easy to know who you're listening to because you will trust Him and you will obey Him. And then you will experience Him. If you're listening to Satan, you're going to try to do things on your own. You're going to try to fix your own marriage. You're going to try to solve your life's problems. You're trying to deal with your own issues. You're going to go your own way. You're not going to follow the plan of God. You're going to try to get out of all any kind of difficulty you're going to try to get out of. You're not going to trust God in it. You're not going to fight through it. You're just going to run from it. By the way, you can't run from your problems. They will follow you. Because your problems are yours, they belong to you, and they will chase you down and attack you. So you might as well fight it with somebody who has the ability to, to deal with it, to give you strength when you're weak, and peace when you have problems. And I know, I know that God is, don't you? And if God is, why do we see, keep seeking proof? 
Why don't we just live in a way that says, I know God lives because he lives in me. Does he live in you today? Let's stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, if they could just get rid of those voices to tempt them to doubt you, if they could just rid them, free themselves, Lord God, of those voices that tell them to, to get off the plan of God and to get on their own plan, if they would just quit listening to the voices that seek proof of something that is so fundamentally true, your presence and your person, if we could be free from those thoughts, we would be full of your spirit. And if we were full of your spirit, we would have love and we would have joy and we would have peace and we would be long-suffering and there would be gentleness and goodness and we would have faith and meekness and temperance because there's nothing that keep us, can keep us from a life that was, is without law, without sin, like the spirit of God. The question is, Father, what is true to these people today? struggling with those voices, I, I, I want you to know I'm with you. I get it. I get the wrestling match that goes on. What I want you to I want you to come forward. I just want you to pray, and I want you just to say, God, I need clarity. So come on. Come on. Pray and just say, God, I need clarity. Come on. I know Satan's holding you back. Come on. I need clarity, God. I need it to be clear. I need clarity. My head is clouded right now. I'm struggling with provision, and I'm struggling that Satan's trying to speak to us and he knows that it sucks the life out of us but he is the way and the truth and the what? The life. And we get to go to the Father because of that life. And we get to have him answer our questions about provision where we can rely on his promises. And we get to find strength in the plan to survive it and not just sur survive in it but thrive in it. He doesn't have to prove himself to us. We already know he's real. We know he's God. We know what he can do. We know what he will do. And we know when this is all over, when all this earth is over, Satan will never speak another word to me again. And I don't got to be confused by what's true because I'll be living a life of truth. I'll be in the most truest place ever created, and that is heaven. Where love is true, and joy is true, and peace is true. Comfort is true. Father, help them with their temptations. Help them fight that voice that wants to doubt, be discouraged, 
and deny your existence. And let them leave this place today, Lord God, being able to recognize your voice from his voice. he wants you to rely on him he doesn't want you to get it on your own he doesn't want you to think that life is going to be easy he wants you to realize it's only easy with him and he doesn't want to feel like he has to prove himself because he doesn't need to prove himself father i love you encourage our hearts as we let stay here and worship for a bit father of those who want to leave lord god i just pray they leave this place believing that you're the only truth we need to be listening to. Encourage your hearts as we leave this place. We love you, and Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, God bless. Thanks for coming to New Life, guys. Have a great week. Stay in worship.